Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. And today's story is The Long Game. I've named this tale The Long Game since it actually spans over the course of several years leading to the satisfying conclusion. Also, because it's a long story, I'll understand if you skip this one for a shorter one. Several years ago, I was in desperate need of a job. I was recently released from active duty in the US Army under a medical discharge met my girlfriend, who's currently my wife, who moved in with me with her two small children from a previous marriage, and I was bouncing around from dead-end job to dead-end job. I had very little real-world skills to offer to employers, so my options were limited. I took a chance and interviewed with a small security company and was immediately hired. They liked that I was prior service, grilled me with questions only a veteran would know, and sent me to work on their biggest contract. I was on a site of a massive multi-million dollar construction location. A large-named oil company was building a new headquarters, and well, massive construction project just doesn't seem like a big enough description. As security, a bulk of our responsibility was checking and vetting all construction workers and contractors through the gate, inspect vehicles for possible stolen property, and generally serve as a deterring force. To put it simply, every day my gate alone would process about 1-2,000 to 2, cars during my 8-hour shift. The site was running 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, to meet the very tight construction schedule. I was only on one of three gates, so that's about three to 6,000 cars that came on site every day in an eight-hour period. Massive construction site. As a side note that will become very important later in the story, each car that came through had to undergo a strict inspection when the driver is first assigned to work on the site. Then the vehicle gets a sticker and is allowed to drive onto the construction site. We would ensure the car has the sticker and then just process everyone's badge through a verification machine. If all badges passed and the car had a sticker, then we would let the contractors on site so they can get to work. Working there was great. All the security were ex-military, so beyond a little teasing about who they served with, everyone bonded really well. We didn't have sick days or vacation days, so when people would call off for personal reasons or illness, everyone happily chipped in to make up the lost hours. And because of this teamwork, our big boss overlooked the call-offs and let us make overtime money. No write-ups, no punishments. Sometimes we were working 16-hour shifts back to back. I spent many nights sleeping in the parking garage in between shifts because it was easier than driving home to sleep a few hours only to come back to work for another 16-hour day. We were in outdoor conditions in all weather and were on our feet on concrete the entire time. Sitting down was a luxury that we rarely saw. We couldn't leave the gate for any reason unless we were relieved by a supervisor who would try to come by twice during an 8-hour shift to let you go to the porta potty or quickly eat your lunch. Rain, harsh summer heat, bug storms, yes, that's a thing, hail, you were out by your gate with no protection other than a construction hard hat. I know these sound like horrendous conditions, but really, it was the best job I ever had. Because of the conditions, it was no wonder that 95% of the employees were male. We tried hiring females, but most would last a few days before quitting. Those people who did not quit in a few days were lifers and loved the job. The problems began about three months into the job. One of the supervisors was quitting to go back to school, so a position opened up. Everyone was given an opportunity to apply for the supervisor position. I was encouraged by the night shift supervisor, who was the one quitting, to go for the promotion because he thought I would be a good replacement for him, even though I was the newest officer on the site and had the least amount of experience. So I threw in my hat just for laughs. Two other people applied. One was a guy who had obvious seniority. The other was a girl, one of three on the site, who had been there for about a year. We were given a face-to-face -face interview with the boss. We'll call him Jim. My interview went well, and Jim liked that I was ambitious. Jim was also the guy who accepted me onto the site in the first place. The next phase of testing was a practice run as a temporary supervisor. We were each given a day to be the supervisor in charge. Jim was there along with a junior supervisor named Ray. Yeah, that's a good name for him. For clarification, Ray did not want the promotion and was happy performing his regular duties. Both were present just in case situations occurred that was beyond our ability to handle. They were standing by to assist. My test day went well. I finished all tasks assigned to me, and I even managed to handle a minor emergency on my own. The other two applicants apparently didn't do so well. The senior guy kept forgetting his list of tasks he was given to accomplish and kept going back to the office to ask Jim what he should do next. The girl did okay, but every time she would check up on the guards, she would flaunt around her temporary rank, make employees call her ma'am, and bragging about how she was definitely going to be getting the promotion. Imagine her shock when I was given the position as the new night shift supervisor. To say she was angry was an understatement. Apparently, she was so upset that she didn't get the promotion that she called me on my personal cell phone. She stole my number from the supervisor emergency phone. 
To add to the situation, I had not yet been informed I got the promotion. Nothing official had been put out just yet. Not a direct quote, but paraphrasing as best as I can. Me. Hello? Girl. How does it feel? Me. Um, who's this? Girl. What? You don't know? I thought supervisors are supposed to know everything. Me. Very confused. You called OP. I think you may have the wrong number. Girl. I know who I called. Don't pretend like you don't know. You got the promotion because you're all sexist pigs. Me. I got the promotion? Cool. Girl. That promotion was supposed to be mine, but I guess since I'm not in the bro club, they just gave it to you. If you don't resign the position to me, I'm going to tell HR about all this sexism, and you'll all be fired. Me. What sexism? I got the position by passing the tests. Isn't it sexist to assume you should get the promotion only because you happen to be born a female? Isn't that act alone sexist? Girl. But only men get promoted to leadership positions. Me. 95% of the site is male. Odds are males are going to get promoted. Sorry you didn't make the cut, but none of this is my problem. So, I hung up the phone and called both Jim and Ray to inform them about the call. I was assured that I was promoted. They didn't know how she found out, and they were going to file harassment on my behalf to HR for her stealing my phone number from the work phone and contacting me with threats. And that's where the story should end. But, oh no, fellow readers, it has only just begun. Now would be a good time to get some popcorn and a drink. So, about two to three months roll by, and I'm getting into the role of supervisor. Girl has since been removed from the site, and the employees are really happy that I'm the new supervisor and that Girl is gone. Things continue as normal, and I begin bonding with my staff. I especially bond with a guard that no one liked. His name for this story is Victor. Victor is a Marine veteran. He was in the initial invasion of Iraq and developed severe PTSD. It makes him very confrontational, argumentative, and a super big a-hole to anyone who talks to him. I liked the guy from the get-go, and we quickly became close friends. Every night I would hang out with him between my duties and we would talk. I eventually convinced him to seek help from the Veterans Association and go to PTSD counseling. He was also going to school to get his masters, thanks to Ray, who convinced him not to give up on his education and would just need to vent sometimes. I was that vent. He would blow up at me, yell and scream, and when he was done we would hug it out. It was therapy for him and I didn't mind. All seemed to be going well until one day I came to visit with Victor. What I didn't know was that Victor was pulling a 16-hour shift and actually worked the afternoon and the night shift. So when I showed up to work, he had already been there a majority of the day. He asked me if I spoke with Jim recently. I hadn't. Apparently, Jim didn't show up to work today. A few days go by, and well, Jim mysteriously disappeared. After three or four days of his disappearance, Ray called an emergency meeting with the supervisors. In attendance was myself, Ray, and another supervisor from the second shift, who's not important and does not require a fictional name. The meeting was to try and figure out what happened to Jim. We pooled our knowledge together and decided the best course of action was to contact the main headquarters branch to see if they knew something. He wasn't answering the phone when we called him, so we feared he was in the hospital and no one bothered to tell us. When we called, we were given the runaround, but eventually an HR rep who was friends with Ray spilled the beans. Jim had quit the job. Girl from earlier apparently made good on her threats. After she was kicked out of the site, she got a hold of a lawyer and began the process of suing the company not only for sexism and favoritism, but also sexual harassment. As it turned out, Jim was a lonely man. Girl and Jim began flirting and eventually sexting, and the idiot used the company's supervisor's cell phone to do it. She not only had copies of the messages, but when the company dug into the phone records, they had all the evidence needed to see she was not lying. There were pictures. Lots of pictures. Girl was brilliant. Evil, but brilliant. She knew that the old supervisor was going to go back to school eventually, so she began flirting with Jim. She pursued him. Each conversation in person, she would be flirtatious, rubbing him and even having sex with him. On the phone, however, she played coy and made him take charge. In the end, this evidence looked like he pressured her to have sex with him and promised a promotion in a bout of pillow talk and before anyone knew that the position was going to be open to her in exchange for sex acts. At the time, it was roleplay, but now it appears like this was all part of her insurance plan to get promoted for real. That was more than enough for the company to do something. When Jim caught wind of what was happening, he took off. This left us without a boss, and worse, in order to avoid a lawsuit, the company rehired Girl to her old position, replaced her on our site, paid her enough money to cover her missed salary, plus a bonus and a raise, and promised to get more females on the site and on supervisor positions. This was enough to satisfy Girl, so she dropped the lawsuit. As the only form of authority on the site, we three supervisors took it upon ourselves to run the site as best we could, until a new boss was assigned, to help us, or one of us was promoted to the position. Almost two months went by and Girl was a huge nuisance. She was constantly calling off her shift at the last minute, and since everyone didn't like her, no one was willing to cover her shift. 
We attempted to write her up for the situation, but she quickly threw it back in our face and threatened to call her lawyer for harassment. After all, none of the male employees get written up when they call off. Obviously, this is sexism and boys club all over again. She pushed her luck too far one day, however, and severely disrespected one of the oil company representatives during his visit. He had her permanently removed from the site. When the security company tried to take her side, for fear of another lawsuit, he said either girl is gone or he'll get another security company to take over the contract. The company gave in and moved her to another site. But even though girl was now out of our lives forever, the absolute nightmare she started was still forming overhead. The company finally found a suitable replacement for Jim, that was also female, to satiate the terms set forth by girl's lawyer. Our new boss was named, well, I have a lot of names for that sea hag, but for now I'll refer to her as Tasha. Tasha was a handful from the get-go. As the new boss, she was working on the site for nearly two weeks, before she ever introduced herself to either the second shift supervisor or myself. I still work nights. What boss does that? Two weeks before you introduce yourself to the supervisors? It took her another month to eventually meet all the guards. The site was busy, but it wasn't that big. Already she was off to a bad start. She was also non-military and didn't seem to respect the fact that every guard and supervisor was a military vet. Most of us served in war zones, lived in the dirt, and were very self-sufficient. She saw everyone as a brainless meathead who needed constant supervision. The term micromanager isn't strong enough of a description to understand the level of hands-on she needed to have. And it probably would have been much different if she was improving things or making things more efficient. But she was barely able to perform the simplest tasks, made constant poor decisions, and just kind of ticked everyone off whenever she was around. We three supervisors tried to train her and bring her up to speed with the site, but she wouldn't hear any of our advice. After about another week or so from her introduction to everyone, she began to get worse. We started seeing a ton of write-ups flooding across our desks, like dozens and dozens for a single employee. And the write-ups, while technically correct, were of the most petty things imaginable. Her favorite was writing up employees for breaking uniform regulations. You have a stray string on your uniform? Write-up. Shoes dirty? Write-up. A haircut she didn't like? Write-up. Glasses smudged? Write-up. The best was her riding up a guard because his uniform was wet, because it was raining outside, and we were not allowed to seek shelter because of our duties. Every gate had a guard shack available. It was a small space with just enough room for a chair and a table to ride on. It had a small AC and a mini fridge to keep water, Gatorades, and our lunch cold. But no one could use the guard shacks because they were so far away from the gates. Still within eyesight, but we had to physically badge in vehicles and employees, and the verification machine was set up next to the gate. When you swipe a badge, a green or red light flashes and it makes a little beep sound to say whether or not someone is allowed on property. But if you're in the guard shack, you can't physically hear the beep. Reminder, this is a construction site. Nor can you see the lights, because the lights face the vehicle. So you have to stand there and swipe the badge and physically look at the lights to know whether or not to let anyone in. Also, remember the car stickers? They were positioned on the windshield, so you can't see them from a shack 30 feet away from the gate. And because of the massive volume of cars coming and going, there just wasn't any time to walk to the guard shack, much less sit down. We tried to explain that to Tasha, who just didn't seem to care. It also became very clear that she was focusing on one guard at a time. Every write-up and disciplinary meeting was laser-focused on one individual. Eventually, that person would get so sick of the harassment that they would quit. As soon as they were gone, she would focus on another guard. The entire site went from a dream job to the most hostile work environment I'd have ever bore witness to. I served 10 years in the army and served three tours to Afghanistan. I served under some of the most idiotic leadership imaginable, people who only got promoted because they were in the army so long that eventually they would get promotions. Ask a veteran, they'll understand what I mean. And all that time, all those dead-end jobs with king of the tiny pond managers I used to work for were nothing in comparison to Tasha. After two months under her reign, 12 employees quit, including Ray. Yes, apparently supervisors were also under fire. I feel that I'm obligated at this point to mention that Ray is the best D leader I've ever had the luxury of working with. Even though he was technically under me, he was and is the most professional man I've ever known. Period. Everyone on site respected him. Everyone would have followed him to heck and back. Everyone loved Ray. Even when I was promoted above him, instead of being petty, he encouraged me to do better. He trained me and became a role model to myself and many others on the site, including Victor. Remember him from earlier? The PTSD guy that no one liked. Apparently, he had two friends in this world, me and Ray. And now, Ray was bullied out of his job. Pro tip, never F with a Marine, especially one who has nothing left to lose. To put into context how bad this really is, no one quit the company before Tasha took over. Some people left to better opportunities or were new hires who couldn't hack it. But overall, people had worked on that site since construction began five years prior. Some people had been with the company going on for 10 years. 
These were the people she was going after and who she forced to quit. I had quit smoking for three years and things got so bad everyone started smoking again, even myself. You would think with as many people quitting that we would have a worker shortage, but then you would be mistaken. As soon as someone quit, the next day the position was filled again. But second shift supervisor and myself quickly learned that these people were not ex-military. These people were moody, had very bad attitudes with other guards, and the many contractors we were dealing with on a daily basis. They were lazy, would often hide in the guard shacks and would not verify whether or not cars could enter the site. They were messy, both in personality and their surroundings, and generally what one would consider horrible employees. We called Ray to see if he could contact his HR buddy to find out where these people were coming from. And here is where the story gets even worse. Remember when old boss Jim took off? Well, someone had to take the fall for the sexism lawsuit that was forming. So the company terminated another employee. That employee was responsible for staffing the oil company contract. He was also responsible for hiring veterans and verifying them. Remember the questions I was asked at the beginning of this story that only a veteran would know the answers to? Yep, that guy. He was gone. So unfortunately, no more veterans were selected from the hiring pool and sent our way. He was terminated because he originally hired Jim. As it turned out, Tasha, the new terror boss, was actually in charge of an office building contract in another part of the city. She lost the contract to that building, and herself and all her guards were now in limbo and out of a job. Some of the guards were issued to new contracts, but pay and security is usually pretty lousy, normally about minimum wage. But our job paid very well, $15 an hour to start off, because the company was supposed to offer it only to ex-military guards, due to the site contract. I discovered years later that Tasha actually lost the building contract, not because the contract ended naturally, but because she and her guards were useless, that the building hired other people to do their jobs. The person in charge of contracts was sleeping with Tasha. They covered up the contract loss so she can still have a job. Oh, and since military guy got fired during the lawsuit, Tasha's F buddy took over his responsibilities. Hence, Tasha got another site contract, a pay raise, and was selected only because she was female and sleeping with the contract guy. How's that for ironic sexism? And it gets better. And the write-ups and harassment on our site were a ruse to get the veterans to quit their jobs, forcing the company to fill the spot with whoever was available, due to a loophole clause in the oil company contract. It basically allowed the security company to staff open positions, with non-military employees, in an emergency employee shortage incident. And guess who the new lazy employees were? Yep, the old guards that served under Tasha, who were so bad at their job that they lost their own contract. But why them? Because they were requested by name, by the largest contract supervisor Tasha. One by one, I watched my fellow veterans and employees fall under attack and quit, only to be replaced by useless people and backstabbing thugs. I really could go on, but there is a ton that happened during that time period, but it's well past time for some malicious compliance. I was the next to be targeted, and I was the next to quit. The malicious compliance, unfortunately, was not caused by myself initially, but by Victor, who now watched his second and only friend quit from the job site. Victor is my GD hero. After I left, I started working for another security company. Ironically, the guy who hired me was Jim. My direct supervisor? Ray. We three were back together again and worked for another oil and gas company. The pay was awesome and info was shared about Jim getting set up for the fall and whatnot. We tried to get Victor to quit his job and join us at the new company, but the old Marine was on one last mission. Remember those car stickers? Well, as it turned out, Victor had a superpower. For whatever reason, he was able to spot forged stickers from across the gate. Okay, so forged stickers? Yep, they were a problem. The construction site had very limited parking and safety regulations were put in place that only licensed drivers could come on site. The cars also had to pass crazy tests in order to meet the safety regulation compliance. The problem is that construction companies and subcontractors often hire illegal workers or people with criminal history or people who just have crappy cars that probably aren't registered or even inspected by the state. No one really cared, but without licensing they could not drive on site. So, someone began forging car stickers and selling them to all the people who would not legally be able to get them. At first, they were crude, obviously crayon on tape. If you glanced at it, it was passable, but any close inspection would reveal that the sticker was fake. If a fake sticker was found, regulations stated that the car must be pulled over and a security supervisor would need to be contacted. The security supervisor would have to get a hold of the site foreman, a supervisor from the fake sticker driver, and a police officer who would remove the sticker and permanently remove the employee from the site forever. Now, because all the replacement guards were really bad at their jobs, the fake sticker business was in full swing. They were getting better, laser printed on vinyl, and nearly indistinguishable from the real stickers. But Victor was now on a mission. 
He took a position at the main entry gate and began pulling over as many cars as he could with fake stickers. He pulled over so many that a security supervisor, Tasha, was assigned to be nearby at all times. The site had to hire an additional police officer and the site foreman had a permanent representative at the gate. Every day, Victor was pulling over car after car. He started training some of the least useless guards how to do it and what to look for. It became a huge nuisance for Tasha, but she technically couldn't do anything about it because he was following the site rules to the letter. After a month of aggressive crackdown on the fake sticker problem, the oil company representatives held a special meeting with Tasha and Victor to plead with him to stop. He had single-handedly removed so many construction workers and contractors that many companies were pulling their long-term contracts with the oil company. Construction came to a sudden halt and the oil company was hemorrhaging tons of money to either keep on contractors or find new ones, willing to pick up the job where others left off. Best of all, the construction company had been way ahead of schedule, so the oil company sold their old headquarters to someone else in the expectation to move into the newly constructed headquarters. However, incompetent security replacements were not checking vehicles exiting the property, and thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of tools and construction supplies were stolen, causing massive setbacks. Then, the sticker fiasco caused any progress that was still going on to come to a sudden halt. The oil company now had to pay, and greatly inflated rent at their old headquarters because the building was sold, but they had nowhere to send the employees. So the new owners let them stay and jacked up the rent so high that it was causing the oil company to lose massive revenue and stocks were beginning to drop. During the meeting, Victor only asked one question. So, are you changing the regulation to state that illegal drivers are now allowed on site? Of course, they didn't change it. They couldn't and Victor knew it. The meeting came to a close. Victor returned to his gate and continued his mission. After a few days, an accident occurred on site. The blame was the drivers, but the buck was passed to Victor, who became the fall guy, and he was terminated from the security company. Everyone knew it was BS and that he was obviously the scapegoat, but Victor didn't care. He waged his war, and in my eyes, he won. So that's the end of the malicious compliance, and if you made it this far, then good on you. I hope you enjoyed this slice of my life, and I leave you with a wish. I hope the best of your past is worst of your future. If you're still here, then you'll be pleased to know there is a little justice in the world. Victor left security permanently. He finished school with honors and got his master's degree. He also took my advice and sought help for his PTSD. He ended up getting 90% disability from the VA and gets a fat check every month. He technically doesn't have to work anymore, but took a job as a maintenance supervisor at the local city college. He's doing much better mentally and is looking forward to buying a second home. We still talk regularly and is considered a very close friend of mine. Jim, Ray and I worked together for years at another security company. Jim left that company for better pay at a different security company and has only spoken to me once since his departure. From what I hear, he got married and is doing well. Ray took over as a contract manager for an even different security company, much closer to his residence. He is still happily married and adopted his two nephews to raise alongside of his son. We still talk semi-regularly and go drinking at least once a year with Victor. I became a big-time security supervisor at the company and have only recently left due to political conflict. I now am an HVAC technician and me and the wife are doing well. And what of Tasha? Well, she was eventually fired for the heck she caused. It took years to unravel the drama, but eventually karma caught up to her. Jim called me once, after he left to work somewhere else, and warned me that Tasha was looking for a job in a new security company. He just denied her application when he realized who she was, based on the stories Ray and I told him. She then interviewed for the position at my company. Guess who did all employee hiring? This guy. I had another officer send her into my office. She walked in all dressed up, smiling and ready to do her interview. Then she saw me. Her smile faded and she walked out without ever saying anything. I then made a call to Ray and gave him a heads up that she was out there. Several weeks go by and she walked in to interview with Ray. He told me that when she saw him she broke down crying. She confessed that since she was terminated she's been unable to find a job. Everyone who interviews her just so happens to be an ex-military veteran who used to work on an oil company construction site. She was losing her home, her husband left her and took her kids. He found out about the contractor guy she was sleeping with. She was living out of her car. She pleaded with him for a job. And Ray, the most professional man I'd ever met, was an ex-marine. He knew what happened to Victor, about how she threw him under a bus. He told her to beat sand and to tell Satan hi for him when she goes to heck. Pro tip, never mess with a marine. Thank you for watching. Bye.